Shabbat Shalom Mishpacha Vechavarim, Shabbat Shalom Family and Friends. The title of my message today is Hanukkah, Dedication and Rededication. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time of dedication, this time of Hanukkah. Father, I pray that uh, you'll speak to our hearts through the story of the Maccabees and also through the word of God, Father, through Yeshua the Messiah, who's called us to repentance, to holiness, to Hanukkah, to dedication to you, Father, to your holy covenant, to your ways. Speak to us through your word, Father. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open the book of Revelation with me. We're going to start in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and we're going to end in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 as well. Um, why are we starting in Revelation 13 with looking at the end times? The reason is because the story of Hanukkah has a prophetic significance for us living in the end times. And as we go through the, the message, I, I, I trust that you will see some parallels and some important lessons from Hanukkah and the time of the Maccabees, the times that we're living in, and what the scriptures prophesied for the end of the age. And we are living in a day uh, that is accelerating the biblical prophecies, and we are getting very close to the time that is described in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, namely with the last beast, the last ruling empire that will rule the world. So chapter 13 of Revelation, we're going to read the first nine verses, and then we're going to uh, look at some of the story of Hanukkah. So Revelation, Hayit Galut, Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And I saw a beast come up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten royal crowns and its heads, and on its heads blasphemous names. So we know here from the opening of this chapter, uh, Yohanan is describing a beast that comes up out of the sea. A beast is a, a ruling empire. The sea represents the nations, the Gentile nations. The ten horns represents ten kings. And seven heads represents uh, leaders of those, of those ten kingdoms. So ten kings are kingdoms and their kings. Notice that on their ten, on their horns were royal crowns, but on their heads were blasphemous names. These kingdoms, these, these ten kingdoms, they come together, and one thing that unites them is their blasphemy against the God of heaven and their rebellion against the Creator. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. That is a reference to the Greek empire, as we will see. But with feet like those of a bear. The, the bear, this is a, a reference to the prophecy of Daniel. The bear represents Medo-Persia. No, it doesn't represent Russia, as many Bible prophecy teachers claim. It represents Medo-Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And a mouth like the mouth of a lion. That is a reference to Babylon. Babylon is likened to a lion in the book of Daniel. So this kingdom is, is, uh, is representative of Greece, Medo-Persia, and Babylon. To it, the dragon gave its power its throne and great authority. 
one of the heads of the beast appeared to have received a fatal wound, but its fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth followed after the beast in amazement. They worshiped the dragon because he had given him his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who can fight against it? So one thing that these seven kingdoms have in common, these seven heads, is that they're all blasphemous, that they blaspheme the God of heaven, and that they worship Lucifer. They worship Satan. How do they worship Satan? By rebellion against the creator. Because you, Yeshua said you, you cannot have two masters. You either love one and hate the other. Or you, like, these kingdoms are united in their hatred against God and in their, in their hatred against God's holy people. Notice in verse 5, it says, It was given a mouth speaking arrogant blasphemies, and it was given authority to act for 42 months, for three and a half years. So it opened its mouth in blasphemies against Elohim to insult his name and his Shekhinah, his, 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 um, his presence, and those living in heaven. It was allowed to make war on God's holy people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Everyone living on earth will worship it, except those whose names are written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb, slaughtered before the world was founded. So the book of Revelation describes the final 42 months of history, and Yohanan prophetically says that the beast that will come to rule will oppress the holy people and he will make war against God's holy people and he will prevail. He will defeat them. And this, this uh, beast will have authority worldwide. Every tribe, every people, every language and every nation. And this beast is going to force all the nations to worship this, uh, this beast system. And we know from the Greek empire, they worshiped their leader. We know the Romans considered their emperor a god who was worshiped. So nothing new in the book of Revelation here. Verse 9, for those who have ears, let them hear. So, Father, give us ears to hear so that we may hear what you are saying. The seven heads of the beast that the book of Re Revelation describes, the scriptures show us plainly that these are seven world empires throughout history that have ruled the world. The first empire was Egypt. The second was Assyria. The third was Babylon. The fourth was Medo-Persia. The fifth was Greece. The sixth was Rome. And the seventh is the Turkish Ottoman Empire. But not only was the Turkish Ottoman Empire ruling the world, but there was another mixture with the Persian, uh, the, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, and that is the, the papacy. Because when the Turks took over the Middle East, there was a lot of conflict between the, the, the Turkish uh, Muslims and the, the Catholic Crusaders, and they fought to control the Middle East. Yohanan says that 
um, elsewhere in the book of Revelation that five kings have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, if you remember in the book of Revelation. So if you look at that list, five have fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One is, that is the kingdom of Rome, and that was when Yohanan wrote the book of Revelation, and one is yet to come. And else, you know, in the book of Revelation, he explains that the one to come is the one that receives the mortal wound, and that he's also the eighth, who is the final ruling kingdom. So, one thing that all of these kingdoms have in common is that they blasphemed the God of heaven and they oppressed God's people. They oppressed Israel. They, you could say they were full of anti-Semitism. They persecuted God's people, starting with Egypt that enslaved the people of Israel. And God raised up Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. Assyria took the northern kingdom into captivity, the 10 tribes, and dispersed them. The Babylonians, they destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BCE and took the kingdom of Judah captive for 70 years. And a portion of the, the Jews returned after 70 years to uh to Israel, to Jerusalem. The Medo-Persian Empire also was uh, persecuting the, the people of God. In fact, the story of Purim of Queen Esther from, is from that Medo-Persian period. And the kingdom of Greece is the fifth empire. And the events of Hanukkah occurred in, in the, under the kingdom of Greece. So that we're going to touch on. Alexander the Great, he was the uh, first emperor of Greece. He conquered the world faster than any other ruler before him. This is why the book of Daniel likens his empire to that of a leopard, swift. In fact, uh, um, he was so uh, swift and so ruthless that uh, in record time, he conquered the world. And um, Daniel chapter 7, if you want to turn there with me, we're going to look at a little bit in chapter 7 and in chapter 11. Daniel chapter 7 verse 6 describes this kingdom of Greece. He says, after this I looked and there was another one like a leopard with four birds' wings on its sides. The animal also had four heads, and it was given power to rule. So Daniel describes the, the uh, prophetically, describes the, the Greek empire to come to be as a swift le leopard. Notice it says it has four wings. So it not only is swift, but it also flies really fast. And the animal has four heads. Four heads meaning four kings, right? And it's given power to rule. And Alexander the Great, after ruling for 12 years, he died. And he left no posterity, no heir. And so as Daniel 7 describes the animal that has four heads, before Alexander the Great died, he divided his empire between four of his most trusted generals. And they became rulers and they became kings in their respective four kingdoms after the death of Alexander the Great. If you turn a little bit forward to Daniel chapter 11, look at Daniel 11 and verse 3. Then a powerful king will appear who will rule a vast kingdom and do whatever he pleases. But once he appears, his kingdom will be broken up and divided to the four winds of heaven. It won't be inherited by his descendants, and it won't be ruled with the power he had. 
because his kingship will be uprooted and will pass to others than his own posterity. So in one of those four kingdoms, in the kingdom of the north, an evil king arose by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And Epiphanes means illustrious one. It's interesting that Lucifer is also called illustrious one, the angel of light. But he was such a, a madman, people mockingly called him Epimenes. Epimenes means the madman. And Daniel describes his reign. If you go a little bit further in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 21, it says, there will arise in his place a despicable man not entitled to inherit the majesty of his kingdom. But he will come without warning and gain the kingdom by intrigue. So he takes the kingdom by trickery. And I'm going to uh, read three sections from the book of Maccabees, the first book of Maccabees, the first, the first four chapters of the first book of Maccabees describes the events that led up to Hanukkah and the celebration of Hanukkah. Um, and I'm going to just read three uh, segments from those uh, first four chapters. The first reading I'm going to uh, read is from the beginning of the book of Maccabees. First Maccabees chapter one and starting in verse one. After Alexander, the son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came from the land of Kittim, had defeated King Darius of the Persians and the Medes, he succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. He fought many battles, conquered strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. When the earth became quiet before him, he was exalted, and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a very strong army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became tributary to him. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying, so he summoned his most honored officers who had been brought up with him from youth and divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. Then his, of then his officers began to rule, each in his own place. They all put on crowns after his death, and so did their descendants after them for many years. And they caused many evils on the earth. And now begins to describe Antiochus. From them came forth a sinful root. Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus, he had been a hostage in Rome. He began to reign in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. In those days, certain renegades came out from Israel and misled many, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles around us. For since we separated from them, many disasters have come upon us. This proposal pleased them, and some of the people eagerly went to the king, who authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So they built the gymnasium in Jerusalem according to Gentile custom, and removed the marks of circumcision, and abandoned the holy covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. So the first book of Maccabees describes how when the Greek empire ruled the Middle East, that there were some in Israel who chose voluntarily to adopt the Greek culture and the Greek religion. They forsook 
the covenant of their fathers, as, as we read. They abandoned the covenant of circumcision. They abandoned the Torah and instead went to gym to work out, stay fit and uh, look good. And those who joined the Greeks were actually highly favored. They received promotions from the Greeks. They, they were uh, rewarded. But when Antiochus Epiphanes came to power, he decided, okay, I'm going to force the rest of the people to accept my religion, whether they like it or not. And we're going to look at that momentarily. If you still have Daniel 11 open, look with me in Daniel 11 when Daniel describes uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the forced Hellenization in verses 29 to 35. Daniel 11, verses 29 to 35. At that time designated, he will come back to the south. So this is describing the king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes. He comes to the south against Ptolemies, but this time things will turn out differently than before because ships from Katim, from Rome, will come against him so that his courage will fail him. Then in retreat, he will, make, he will take furious action against the Holy Covenant. Again, showing favor to those who abandon the Holy Covenant. So notice uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is, as Daniel prophesied, he will um, take furious action against the Holy Covenant, against the Torah. And he's going to favor those who abandon the covenant. Look at verse 31. Armed forces will come at his order and profane the sanctuary and fortress. They will abolish the daily burnt offering and set up the abomination that causes desolation. Those who act wickedly against the covenant, he will corrupt with his blandishments. But the people who know their Elohim will stand firm and prevail. So this is a prophetic reference to the Maccabees. And um, perhaps you've heard uh, people quote this verse, Daniel eleven thirty-two, 32, that those people who know their God will do great exploits. And it's a great promise, but it's, it's a prophetic promise, uh, a prophetic uh, insight into the time of the Maccabees. Those among the people who have discernment will cause the rest of the people to understand what is happening. Nevertheless, for a while, they will fall victim to sword, fire, exile, and pillage. When they stumble, they will receive a little help, although many who join them will be insincere. Even some of those with discernment will stumble so that some of them will be refined, purified, and cleansed for an end yet to come at the designated time. So here we see from the prophet Daniel a description of this cruel, ruthless king who forces the Jewish people to abandon the Holy Covenant, and forces Hellenization on them. Notice in verse 31, he sets up the abomination that causes desolation. The word abomination means that which is hated. 
that which is abominable, that which is despised. He caused an abomination. How? By defiling the holy temple and by offering an unclean animal, a pig, on the altar. And he set up an idolatrous statue in the temple court. That is abominable. The Torah forbids such despicable action. He caused desolation. And desolation means he caused the altar to become desolate, become empty by putting an end to the daily sacrifices. I want to switch to a, a second reading from the first book of Maccabees in chapter 1 from for verse 41 to 64. Speaking about the forced Hellenization. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that all should give up their particular customs. And all the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and they profaned the Shabbat. And the king sent letters And the king sent letters to, is that two pages? No. By messengers to Jerusalem, thank you, and the towns of Judah, he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so that they would forget the Torah and change all the ordinances. He added, whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. Just want to pause here. Because we live in a day and age where there's a religious system that has abandoned the marks of the circumcision that has abandoned the Shabbats and the festivals of the Torah that has instituted a new religion called Christianity that says you can eat unclean animals because God's changed his mind and the Roman Catholic Church has rejected the Shabbat and instituted the day of sun worship as the day of the Lord, as the day to worship. And if you look at church history, the Roman Catholic Church actually forced Jews to eat pork or be killed. So nothing new, nothing different from the time of the Greeks, the Greek empire. And what is fascinating about the story of the Maccabees is that they rose up. They rose up and they said no to compromise, no to idolatry. 
And they resisted compromise at all cost, even if it cost them their lives. I'm going to continue reading from the back, the, the first chapter of the first book of Maccabees, verse 51. In such words, he wrote to his whole kingdom. He appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the towns of Judah to offer sacrifice town by town. Many of the people, everyone who forsook the Torah, joined them, and they did evil in the land. They drove Israel into hiding in every place of refuge they had. Now, on the 15th day of the month of Kislev, and this is the month we're in, in the 145th year, that's the year of the Greek Empire, 145th year of the kingdom of the Greeks, they erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. They also built altars in the surrounding towns of Judah and offered incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. The books of the Torah that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Anyone found possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the Torah was condemned to death by decree of the king. They kept using violence against Israel, against those who were found month after month in the towns. On the 25th day of the month, they offered sacrifice on the altar that was on top of the altar of burnt offering. So the Greeks, they set up an idolatrous altar on top of the holy altar of sacrifice in the temple. And on it, they offered an unclean animal to their gods. According to the decree, they put to death They put to death the women who had their children circumcised. And their families. And those who circumcised them. And they hung the infants from their mother's necks. So you can see the, the, the brutality, the cruelty of this beast, the Greek Empire, under Antiochus Epiphanes. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant. And they did die. Very great wrath came upon Israel. So to summarize, and this is in your notes, uh, in the historical background about Hanukkah. He forbid the Jewish people to circumcise their sons. He forbid them to keep the Shabbat and the appointed feast days of the Torah. Jewish people were forced to eat pork or be killed. Righteous Jews escaped the towns and cities into the wilderness, and under Judah the Maccabee and his brothers, they fought against the Greeks, and they won against all odds. And the, the, the book, the two books of Maccabees, they detail those battles in great detail. They were outnumbered. They were without military training, without uh, without weapons, and yet they they won literally with sticks and stones against the trained army of thousands. It's miraculous. You can read about it in the books of the Maccabees.
righteous Jews escaped their towns and cities into the wilderness and under Yehuda the Maccabee and his brothers, they fought against the Greeks and won against all odds. When Jerusalem was recaptured, the altar was torn down stone by stone and a new altar made of unhewn stones as the Torah instructs was built. The temple was rededicated to Adonai. And the altar was rededicated to Adonai for eight days, as the Torah instructs, that for eight days there was a time of consecration for seven days. And on the eighth day, the altar was uh, operational. So historically, the holiday of Hanukkah has nothing to do with some miracle of oil. In fact, that's a legend that was added. The, the eight days have to do with the eight days of consecration and dedication of the temple and the altar. So the temple was rebuilt and rededicated to Adonai for eight days, starting on the 25th day of Kislev, on the very day that the Greeks defiled the holy altar, on that very same day, they rededicated it to the Most High. I'm going to read from 1 Maccabees chapter 4 regarding that rededication. Then said Yehuda and his brothers, Behold, our enemies are crushed. Let us go up and cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. So all the army assembled and they went up to Mount Zion. And they saw the sanctuary desolate, the altar profaned, and the gates burned. In the courts they saw bushes sprung up as in a thicket, or as on one of the mountains. They saw also the chambers of the priests in ruins. Then they rent their clothes and mourned with great lamentation and sprinkled themselves with ashes they fell face down on the ground and sounded the the signal of the trumpets and cried out to heaven then Yehuda detailed men to fight against those in the citadel until he had cleansed the sanctuary he chose blameless priests devoted to the Torah and they cleansed the sanctuary and removed the defiled stones to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do about the altar of burnt offering, which had been profaned, and they thought it best to tear it down, lest it bring reproach upon them, for the Gentiles had defiled it. So they tore down the altar and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple hill until there should come a prophet to tell what to do with them. Then they took unhewn stones as the Torah directs and built a new altar like the former one. They also rebuilt the sanctuary and the interior of the temple and consecrated the courts. They made new holy vessels and brought the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table into the temple. Then they burned incense on the altar and lighted the lamps on the lampstand, on the menorah, and they gave light, and these gave light in the temple. They placed the bread on the table and hung up the curtains. Thus they finished all the work that they had undertaken. Early in the morning on the 25th day of the of the ninth month, which is the month of Kislev, in the 148th year, they rose and offered sacrifice as the Torah directs on the new altar of burnt offering, which they had built at the very season and at the very day that the Gentiles had profaned it. It was dedicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and worshipped and blessed heaven who had prospered them. 
So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness. They offered a sacrifice of deliverance and praise. They decorated the front of the temple with golden crowns and small shields. They restored the gates and the chambers for the priests and furnished them with doors. There was very great gladness among the people, and the reproach of the Gentiles was removed. Then Yehuda and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season, the days of the dedication of the altar should be observed with gladness and joy for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Kislev. So here you can see the historical background to the establishment of the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the word Hanukkah in Hebrew means dedication. And when the altar was consecrated back to Adonai and the temple was restored, this holiday was instituted to remember God's victory that he gave to his people and to celebrate it every year in this month. We know in the New Covenant scriptures that Yeshua came to the temple at the time of Hanukkah. I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to touch on it. In Yohanan chapter 10, in verse 22, it says, Then came Hanukkah in Yerushalayim. It was winter. And Yeshua was at the temple teaching. And at the time of Hanukkah in Israel, when Yeshua was uh, on this earth, at the time of Hanukkah, there was high expectation of a military-style deliverer like the Maccabees to rise up and break the yoke of the Romans. And so when in Israel they were waiting for the Messiah, they were waiting for a deliverer who would break the yoke of the Romans and uh, the oppression and the yoke of the Romans was not any lighter than that of the Greeks before them. They were ruthless. They were brutal towards the Jewish people. And so Yeshua was confronted by the Jewish leaders who said, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Are you the promised deliverer? And Yeshua said, I've already told you, and you did not believe me. And he says, my sheep, they hear my voice, the voice of another, they will not follow. And you can read about that in John chapter 10. As we bring some application, um, I want us to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I'm going to read starting in verse 9. Because in the Torah, we are instructed not to compromise. So the, the Maccabees, they were clinging to the covenant because the covenant in the Torah forbids mixing with idolatry, mixing with the worship and the practices of the, of the goyim, of the nations of the Gentiles. We're instructed not to compromise by observing any of the customs of the Gentiles. So we can put Halloween in that list. We can put Christmas in that list. We can put Easter. We can put Valentine's Day. I hope you still like me, but Father's Day, Mother's Day, they all have one thing in common. <laughs> They're all on Sundays, instituted by the Whore of Babylon, by the apostate church. Look at verse 9, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you enter into the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, you are not to learn how to follow the abominable practices 
of those nations. There must not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through fire, a diviner, a soothsayer, an enchanter, a sorcerer, a spellcaster, a consulter of ghosts or spirits, nor a necromancer. For whoever does these things is detestable to Yahweh. And because of these abominations, Yahweh your Elohim is driving them out ahead of you. You must be blameless. The complete Jewish Bible uses the word wholehearted. The Hebrew word is tamim. We've looked at that word because Noah was tzaddik and tamim. He was righteous. He was blameless. And the Torah commands us, you are to be blameless. That's undefiled, complete, just like the animals that were offered on the sacrifice altar. They were to be blameless without blemish. They were tamim. So Adonai says, you are to be blameless with Yahweh your Elohim. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners, but you, Yahweh your Elohim, does not allow you to do this. Yahweh will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen, you are to pay attention to him, just as when you were assembled at Horeb and requested Yahweh your Elohim. Don't let me hear the voice of Yahweh my Elohim anymore, or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I will die. On that occasion, Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they are saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you. From among their kinsmen, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. So in Deuteronomy 18, the Torah instructs us, do not copy the nations around you. Do not practice their abominable practices, their idolatry. But you are to be tamim. You are to be blameless. You are to obey the instructions of the Torah. We started in the book of Revelation. Let's go and end in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. I'm going to read from verse 7 on through to the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 13 starting in verse 7. And I believe that we're living in the generation that is going to see the climax of the prophetic uh, timeline of, of the apocalypse, of the, uh, of the final kingdom that will come and rule the earth. So it, the beast, in verse 7, it was allowed to make war on God's holy people. God's holy people are who? Israel. Not the apostate Israel that compromised and adopted Hellenization as they did in uh, the Greek period. But God's holy remnant. Those who, remember, cling to the covenant. So those are God's holy people. In Revelation chapter 12, in the last verse, God's holy people are described as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua, the Messiah. So they cling to Yeshua, the Messiah, and they keep the Holy Torah. These are God's holy people that Revelation 13 is talking about. So if you expect the anti-Messiah to make war against Judaism, think again. Because Judaism is not keeping the Torah. It's not. It's keeping man's traditions. And they reject the Messiah Yeshua. They reject the one who came. And so when it says that he is making war on God's holy people, it's talking about the remnant who keep the Torah 
and cling to Yeshua, the Messiah. And on the other hand, if you think that the anti-Messiah is going to persecute the Christians, we also have to think again. Because we have a president in the United States who is a professed Catholic who is ready to do the bidding of the Pope, the man of sin. And the war is not going to be against Catholics. It's not going to be against the Judaism. It's going to be against the remnant of God's holy people. And to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Everyone living on earth will worship it, except those whose names are written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb, slaughtered before the world was founded. Those who have ears, let them hear. We read that at the outset of our service. And let's continue, verse 10. If anyone is meant for captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he is to be killed. The, the book of Revelation makes allusion to the prophet Jeremiah, who, when he was prophesying the destruction of the temple, he said one, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah, he said one third of you will die by the sword. One third of you will go into captivity. And one third of you will die from the famine and from the pestilence. This is when God's holy people must persevere and trust. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And notice that the first beast comes from the sea. This other beast comes from the earth. And I asked the question, could it be that he comes up out of the land, out of the Holy Land, out of Israel? Let's wait and see. I'm not going to uh, say that's how it's going to be. I'm just a student of prophecy. And when these things take place, we will see clearly who the identity of the false prophet will be. This, uh, this beast has two horns like those of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon so notice he tries to look like a good guy but really talks like the dragon so he tries to pretend to look like a lamb he tries to pretend to look like one of god's people but really speaks blasphemies and i believe this is a very clear description of the papacy and the roman catholic system and the apostasy that it upholds it had two horns like those of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, the one whose fatal wound had been healed. It performs great miracles, even causing fire to come down from heaven onto the earth as people watch. It deceives the people living on earth by the miracles it is allowed to perform in the presence of the beast. And it tells them to make an image honoring the beast that was struck by the sword, but came alive again. It was allowed to put breath into the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak. And it was allowed to cause everyone who would not worship the image of the beast to be put to death. So the book of Revelation is saying that there will be martyrdom, that people who are loyal to Yeshua and his Torah will die. They will be put to death, but they are encouraged to persevere and hold on to their faithfulness to Yeshua to the very end. And martyrdom of believers in Yeshua has been happening ever since Yeshua came has been and continues to happen and will happen. We are seeing more and more deception through false miracles performed in the name of a lawless Messiah. So we have the Roman Catholic Church, 
We have the Reformed Catholics who are Protestants. Many of them are very charismatic. I came out of the Pentecostal movement. And the false prophet is allowed to perform these miracles. However, in verses 16 to 18, we see that there is total control of the whole world's population. And this control is through mass surveillance and computer technology and control over the money through a completely controlled uh, currency system. Look at it, it's, look at verse 16. Also it forces everyone, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, preventing anyone from buying or selling unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This is where wisdom is needed. Those who understand should count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and its number is 666. So Yohanan gives us a hint that the numerology of the name of this beast is going to add up to 666. So we'll wait and see because uh, we have quite a few people who are vying for this position to become the global world leader that uh, rises above all the other nations. And uh, if you have heard about the Great Economic Reset, the UN Agenda for 2030, that uh, is basically going to ish usher in a global reset, meaning uh, uh, complete removal of all the world's currencies and replacing it with a global currency, one that can be controlled. And the Agenda 2030, has been accelerated to be implemented in the year 2023. So folks, we're, I don't know how close we are, but we are very close. And the whole COVID crisis and the whole war on climate change are all part of the way that this global system will be implemented. And We don't know what the future holds for us in Canada, but we have a prime minister who is very lawless and, uh, and very much what we call a globalist and would love to uh, be part of that elite, giving power to that beast that is rising up. The same with the president of the United States. Same with all the European leaders. They're all ready to give their power to this one beast, this one uh, ruling figure. So the story of Hanukkah is very relevant for us in this day and age because we live in a culture of compromise. The only thing that's missing is the uh, persecution. But that is quickly changing. Persecution is here and it's increasing. That uh, those who cling to the covenant are going to be persecuted, persecuted severely. We have friends, believers in the land of Israel that uh, are preparing for greater persecution. 
Messianic believers in, in Israel have been persecuted from the very get-go. They are rejected. They are ostracized. They have uh, um, been targeted by religious Judaism as uh, apostates. They uh, are not recognized as Jews. Uh, many Messianic believers have forced, have faced uh, expulsion from Israel. And they've had to legally fight to retain their citizenship in Israel. Uh, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time. And I pray that the Father will give us courage, that the Father will give us uh, boldness to persevere, to, to be loyal to him, to be loyal to his Torah. When we look at the covenant of circumcision, the keeping of Shabbat, the keeping of the Holy Covenant, his appointed feast days, uh, when, we see, when we look at faithfulness to Yeshua the Messiah until he returns, my dear friends, he's coming soon. And when he comes, he will reclaim Jerusalem. He will reclaim the land. And he will reward the faithful. Let us persevere. Let us be strong to the end. And let us take lesson from the Maccabees, from the time of Hanukkah, not to give in, not to give in to pressure, not to give in to compromise, but to be faithful to Yeshua to the very end. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you very much, so much, Father, for, for this Shabbat. Thank you for the lessons from Hanukkah, uh, from the Maccabees, and I pray, Father, you give us hearts that are loyal to you, hearts that are blameless, that are tamim. Father, that we would be faithful to you, be faithful to your covenant, your holy Torah, until Yeshua returns. Father, I ask you that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and write your Torah in our hearts. Father, give us the grace to serve you with joy, with faithfulness, without compromise. Father, I pray in the name of Yeshua that you will bless our community, that you will strengthen our community, that we will walk close to you, that we will honor you, Father, that we will listen to your voice, that we will obey you, Father, that in Ottawa Messianic Fellowship, Father, you will find a people that are loyal to you and dedicated to you, to your ways, to your holy Torah, and to your son, Yeshua, our Messiah. Father, we bless you. With, we bless your holy name. We thank you, Father, that you are faithful to your promises, Father that you will not leave us, you will not forsake us, even though we go through trial, even though we go through tribulation, even though we go through difficulties, you are with us to the very end. And for this, we are so thankful to you, Father. We bless you. We honor you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom.